at a little before nine of the clock of the morning of the 6th of July, 1535, a pale, thin prisoner began the short walk from the gates of the tower to Tower Hill. His steps were laboured, his beard was long, and in his fingers he clasped a simple but striking red cross. A woman emerged from the crowd and offered the man a cup of wine, but he refused, saying that Christ in his passion took no wine, only vinegar. When he reached the scaffold, his feet stumbled, but his legendary wit made one final appearance. He retorted that the lieutenant of the tower may need to assist him up the stairs, but he would manage to find his own way back down. The executioner seemed to shake as he fell to his knees to ask for forgiveness. The man kissed him on his forehead and raised him to his feet and said, pick up thy spirits, man. Do not be afraid to carry out your office. He then turned to the crowd, which immediately hushed. He kept his speech mercifully short. He said, I die the king's good servant, but God's first. With that, he knelt. He said one final prayer. He placed his head on the block and raised his arms to signify he was ready. The executioner plucked up his courage and with one brutal blow of the axe, he removed the head of Sir Thomas More. Greetings, loyal subjects. In today's episode of History with Henry, we discuss one of the most famous figures in the Tudor court, Sir Thomas More. My own relationship with More began when I was around about nine years of age. In this picture, you can see him visiting me and my two sisters. With him is his great friend, the scholar Erasmus of Rotterdam. More is kneeling, giving me a book as a gift. Erasmus, however, had bought no gift, so I challenged him to write me a poem, and so began a long correspondence with that great scholar. This was my first encounter with More, but it certainly wasn't my last. He was born on Milk Street in London on the 7th of February, 1478. He was the son of a wealthy lawyer, and as such, he enjoyed the finest education that money could buy. He went to St. Anthony's School in London. For two years, he served as a page to the Archbishop of Canterbury, John Morton. Morton was a great believer in the new learning, soon to be called humanism. Morton was impressed with young Thomas More's potential and helped secure him a place at Oxford University. More studied there for two years before returning to London at his father's insistence to begin his own legal training. In 1505, he married Jane Colt and the couple had four children together. Then, in 1511, a great tragedy struck. Jane died. Within 30 days, Thomas More had married again, completely ignoring all of the advice of his friends. The woman he married was called Alice Middleton. More was insistent that his young children needed a mother to look after them. Alice Middleton brought with her a daughter from her previous marriage, which Thomas More readily raised as one of his own children. More was unusual for his day, by being just as insistent that his daughters received a fine education, just the same as his son. And in fact, his eldest daughter, Margaret, became a writer and then translator of works in her later years. He soon became elected to Parliament and served as an under-sheriff of the City of London. He then got promoted to the position of Master of Requests. And then his big break arrived. He accompanied Cardinal Wolsey, my chief minister, 
on a diplomatic mission overseas to the Holy Roman Emperor Charles V. On his return to England, I appointed him my personal secretary and one of my own personal advisors. My own relationship with him grew, and with it, so did Thomas More's list of offices. He became High Steward of the universities of both Oxford and Cambridge, and managed to find himself elevated to the position of Speaker of the House of Commons. But outside of politics and court life, Moore had other interests. He was a great scholar and a great writer. His most famous work was called Utopia, which was written entirely in Latin, and it was a book all about life, living on an ideal island. He also wrote a biography on King Richard III. It was written heavily from the Tudor point of view, which dismissed Richard as a wicked man. William Shakespeare used the text as inspiration for his own play. He also wrote many religious works and essays, normally in defence of the Catholic Church, refuting the works of Martin Luther and William Tyndale. And he assisted me in the construction of my own famous book, The Defence of the Seven Sacraments. After Wolsey fell from power, there was simply one choice for Lord Chancellor, Thomas More. And that is when it all started to go wrong. More started pursuing Protestant heretics with a passion. During his time in office, six Protestants were burnt alive at the stake and dark rumours emerged that he would imprison and torture people accused of heresy within the walls of his own home. In 1530, he opposed my divorce from Catherine of Aragon by refusing to sign the letter to the Pope, requesting that he grant me an annulment. Then, when my relationship with the Pope faltered completely, and I elevated myself to supreme head of the church in England, Moore refused to sign the Oath of Supremacy. He was treading on thin ice. Of course, I still liked and respected the man. He resigned the chancellorship. I accepted his resignation and agreed that he could live a private life, as long as he kept his own personal views to himself. But then he refused to attend the coronation of my second wife, Anne Boleyn. Now, despite the fact he never said a word, it was a huge public snub. Strangely, after that point, things began to get a little bit difficult for Thomas More. He soon got accused of accepting bribes when he was in office and also assisting the Holy Maid of Kent, Elizabeth Barton, who would speak openly on the streets of London against my divorce from Catherine. However, finally, both charges were dismissed. But still, he refused to sign the Oath of Supremacy. And he just made matters worse for himself when he refused to sign the Oath of Succession. This stated that Anne Boleyn was the true Queen of England, and all of her children would be the heirs to the kingdom. His enemies at court, and there were quite a few, moved against him, and I was persuaded to agree to his arrest. He was taken to the tower, and there he remained for a year, still refusing, despite numerous visits from Thomas Cromwell and others, attempting to persuade him to sign the oaths. At his trial on the 1st of July, 1535, he kept his silence, believing that he could not possibly be convicted of any crime if he kept his mouth shut. However, Thomas Cromwell produced Richard Rich, a dastardly man who testified that Moore, in Rich's presence, had denied the fact that I was head of the Church of England. It took the jury less than 15 minutes to come back and declare more guilty as charged. He was sentenced to be hung, drawn and quartered. But being the kindly king that I am, I changed that so that he was simply beheaded. After his death, his head was placed on a pike on London Bridge. And according to legend, his daughter Margaret retrieved it and then buried it in her family vault. Of course, Thomas More wasn't the only man that defied me. Over the years, many others stood in my way. 
and we will tell their stories on future episodes of History with Henry.